Hello everyone, Argent here with my first ever fanfic review. So, this is one of my all-time favorite Game of Thrones fanfics, and there's quite a few Game of Thrones fanfics I really like. Uh, the I See True is pretty good. Uh, Friends, Sisters, Lovers, Siblings, I think is what it's called, is one of my favorites. And uh, When a Wolf Met a Star is really good, and I'll review these down the line. But um, I really like the Dragon Cub. I think it does pretty much everything you could want in a Game of Thrones fanfic. And I really admire the author a lot because he answers like all of the comments and all the reviews from the previous chapter pretty much at the bottom of every chapter. Uh, he also has like a very consistent schedule, which is on which is surprising and unusual for a fanfic author because a lot of them tend to like hold the story hostage and say, if I don't get X number of reviews, I'm not going to continue or they'll go on hiatus for like six months without telling anybody. But he pretty much for the last like year or so has been updating every Tuesday and every Thursday. So I admire his like commitment and how often they do it. So what is the Dragon Cub? So the Dragon Cub, the title alludes to the relationship between Jamie and Jon Snow. So let's just read the story summary. Jamie realizes Jon's true identity when visiting Winterfell, remembering a promise made to Rhaegar. Jamie and Jon enter the Game of Thrones together. So it broadly speaking takes place in the show's continuity, but with book characters, if that makes any sense. So like Willis is the oldest son of the Tyrells. Uh, Garland canonically exists in this timeline. But I think most things have kind of been simplified and kind of more in line with the stripped down version of the show. Which I like. Uh, once again, there's like still other characters who are only in the books, like Ariane is in this, etc. So, kind of the background and how we get this thing set up is Jamie finds out that Cersei knew about Tywin's plan to kill uh, Rhaenerys and Aegon, and he's just really upset about it. And she's like, "Yeah, the dragon spawn are dead. Father's a genius," and Jamie just feels completely disgusted by her and breaks up with her after that. And then they aren't in a relationship anymore and have a very strained relationship. So then kind of the second major point of divergence happens during the Greyjoy Rebellion. Uh, Tywin Lannister gets killed. And in part because they need a new Warden of the West, uh, they don't want Tyrion to take the position. And in part because of uh, Cersei not wanting Jaime around anymore. Uh, Jaime gets dis uh, discharged from the Kingsguard and becomes the new Warden of the West and the new Lord Paramount of the Westerlands. So then Jamie decides, for whatever reason, to journey with Robert and Ned up to Winterfell. They kind of invite him as a troll, but whether it was just to screw with them or because Jamie wasn't quite ready to face his responsibilities yet, he goes to Winterfell. And while he's there, he runs into Jon Snow and he's immediately kind of taken with the kid. And the more he watches him and the more he looks at him, the more he, he thinks he resembles Rhaegar, both in terms of mannerisms and appearance. And, and eventually he figures it out and he confronts Ned about it. And it's interesting, in this story, Ned's not portrayed very positively, at least not for the first, like, half of the story. I mean, it's still going, but for the first, like, uh, 30 chapters or whatever. Ned's seen as a very weak man who hasn't really done much in his term as Lord of the North. Like, he hasn't really improved it much. Um, there's been kind of a long period of economic, political, and military decline. Like, it's not that he's a bad person. Uh, they also, the author also takes issue with the idea that Ned didn't adequately prepare his children, which I think is partially true, partially not true. And that he left it entirely up to Kat, and Kat really mismanaged it. And Kat is one of the major villains in this fic, but we'll get to that in a, in a little bit. So he confronts Ned, and as with most stories like this, Ned has Dark Sister. Uh, he also has a dragon egg, and he has. Um, Rhaegar's harp and like a bunch of documents uh, that prove that his marriage to Elia was annulled and John is the, his trueborn son. Now, John was interestingly enough, the, the letter specifically stated that Aegon was still his heir and John was second in line. So I'm kind of like that they actually mentioned Aegon because I feel bad for the kid. He always dies and no one ever talks about him. 
So Jamie has kind of realized this is his second chance at honor. This is his chance to do what he promised Rhaegar to take care of his family. He screwed the rest of it up, but here, here he is. So his plan is he's going to take John as his squire, but really kind of treat him as more of his son. And he's going to remain uh, his ki the king's guard to the true king. Jaehaerys the third, I think, is what John's regnal name is. And he's going to raise him, and then when time comes, he's going to put all the resources of the Westerlands into uh, pushing John as the rightful king of the Seven Kingdoms. So it's, I think, a pretty good setup. Um, and I think the real kind of um, strength of this, and the strength of most good fanfics, is the uh, characters. They take a lot of characters who aren't really that important in the like either the book or the show, and they give them a much bigger role. Like, um, a major supporting character in this is Garion, and if you've never heard of Garion, um, I, I don't blame you. Uh, Garion is the father of Joy Hill, um, who is the bastard Lannister. So, as they say uh, with regards to the, the Lannister brothers, um, Kevin tried to find a place at Tywin's side, Tigret tried to be his own man but just got bitter, and Garion just didn't take anything seriously. So he's really sarcastic and like kind of lighthearted, uh, but can have a bit of a caustic wit. Uh, he's very sympathetic, though, because the only thing he really cares about, I guess, other than his other family, is his daughter, uh, his illegitimate daughter, Joy, who he um, just loves, like, unconditionally, and he just dotes on her constantly. And, uh, like, almost as soon as John arrives there, uh, he's used to having Sansa as, like, his little sister, and I think Arya is just about to be born, and Joy kind of fills that uh, hole in his life. So we get a lot of, like, really cute scenes of John and Joy interacting. Uh, he always reads for a bedtime story. They play horsey together and stuff like that. And we kind of see John gradually grow on the members of the household. Like, initially, a lot of them dislike him, but he kind of wins them over. I think one kind of probably criticism you can make of this is John, I wouldn't call him a Mary Sue because there's like explanations for it. I think the other thing is um, he's kind of gone through his um, dark character arc. It was off screen, but he'd kind of gone through a very difficult childhood. So it kind of makes sense that he's really mature, but he eventually kind of like develops, I think, almost like excessive abilities. Like, he starts to have dragon dreams of Valyria, and he starts to replicate some of the technology there. So he invents, like, um, an early wind wheel, and he invents, like, um, early modern ships and, like, some stuff like that. So that's a little kind of, like, uh, excessive. But yeah, so that kind of goes through for a number of chapters. Um, John eventually becomes uh, best buddies with Loris. I think they do a really good job portraying Loris in this. Loris as a character, I feel, is probably more like a young Jamie than how they kind of portrayed him in the show. Like, his, his homosexuality is kind of like a thing in the background that isn't really, I think, mentioned that much in the books. He's kind of like, he's a bamf. He's a badass mofo. And that's kind of like the, the core feature of him. So him and John just have, like, a really good bromance buddy cop thing. And almost immediately, Marjorie and John kind of hit it off. And there, there's a lot of kind of romantic tension there, although they're very young, so they don't really understand it. And they don't expect there to ever really be a chance of them being together, because at this point in time, they think John is a bastard, although he's actually the rightful king of the uh, Seven Kingdoms. So uh, we just kind of go through it, and pretty much everybody gets screen time, which is nice. Uh, Robert gets screen time. Cersei gets screen time. Jamie does. Ned does. Uh, most of the Stark children do, at least the interesting ones. Uh, Kat's kind of the main villain. Kat and John Aaron are kind of the main villains. We don't really know anything about John Aaron, but he's kind of a massive dick in this, which I thought was interesting. Uh, Kat is really, really bad in this. She's just completely paranoid that John is going to um, uh, usurp Rob uh, and become uh, Lord of Winterfell. Of course, John would never do that, even if uh, he didn't know that he was um, Rhaegar's son. So, like, eventually Jamie tells him, and he decides he's going to go for the throne. 
and it's just kind of an ongoing journey and you just have a lot of interesting stuff that happens um there's a lot of like laugh out loud funny moments a lot of touching moments uh something i like is they focus a lot on economics in this and like um development which is something i always find kind of interesting like part of like jamie and john's master plan is to like um grow the economy of the westerlands through trade and bind themselves closer to other regions like they make really close economic ties with the manderlees so the manderlees would probably support john anyways but they become very enthusiastic supporters of him um they make close relationship with like the uh mormons on bear island uh with the reach etc and they just go through a lot of kind of like economic development stuff like building new castles uh, reopening the mines of Castamere, uh, that kind of thing. So I all like that kind of stuff. Um, it really kind of adds some depth and some world building. Probably the thing, though, that is the most surprising about this is who he winds up pairing Jamie with. And I, I wasn't sure if Jamie was just going to stick to his Kingsguard vows and never, like, marry or something like that. But what winds up happening is he goes north with John after... Um, a tournament they have in King's Landing, and he runs into Daisy Mormont. Now, for those of you who don't know who Daisy Mormont is, because she wasn't in the sh I don't think she was in the show, um, Daisy is, was the heir to the Mormonts, House of Mormont, before uh, she got killed during the Red Wedding, but the Red Wedding hasn't happened in this continuity, nor will it happen. So she's described as being really hot and six feet tall. So she and Jamie hit it off, and they eventually get married, which just makes Jamie even more of a Chad. I mean, how much of a Chad do you have to be to have, like, a six-foot-tall hot wife? Also, their kids are going to be giga-chads, because they have, like, really good genetic material from, like, both sides of the family. And that pisses a lot of people off, because while the Mormons are technically, like, high lords because they're direct vassals of the Starks, they're not, like, under anyone else. They're, like, the poorest, most, like, ghetto house in the north of the major ones. But Jamie's just, like, I think Kevin says to him, just because you're lord doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. And Jamie's like, no, because I'm lord, I can do whatever I want. I want my six-foot-tall QT, and you're not gonna stop me. So, that happens. So the story is kind of ongoing... Um, a lot of kind of unexpected stuff happens, but most characters, like, from canon get a lot of screen time, and everybody kind of gets their own story arc. Um, I'd say, like, Edimir, Kat, and John Aaron are the main villains in this. Cersei's kind of a secondary villain, uh, because she gets in, uh, trouble really early on, but, um, she kind of takes a back seat. An interesting thing about Cersei is, even though her and Jaime split up, uh, her children are still uh, abominations born of incest. Uh, Joffrey is a product of her union with her uncle Tigret and her um, uh, Marcella and Tommen are her having sex with her cousin Damon Lannister. So, yeah, overall, I think it's a very excellent fanfic. Um, it's kind of a fixer fic. Like, where the author is trying to fix all the issues they had with canon. Um, and I think he does a really good job. And like I said, they've, it's, this is a pretty long one. I prefer, well, it depends on the context. If you're going to go for a big story like this, it's better if you make it really long. If you're just going through kind of a short, emotionally intense story, then uh, 40 to 100,000 words is probably best. So yeah, I'll include a link to this down in the description if you want to read it. Um, more fan fiction reviews to come. Uh, let me know what genre of fan fiction you want, uh, what, what universe you want it from, and uh, how the format is. Because I'm, I'm basically just doing this like a reaction review. So God bless, hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll talk to everybody real soon.